good evening, or maybe maybe morning, maybe afternoon. Anyway, um, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome everyone to to be here. Uh, our today's uh, lecture uh, speaker is uh, Professor Hugh Wooding from Harvard University. Uh, he's one of the most important mathematician and logician in today's world. Uh, Professor Wooding was a professor at Caltech, then at Berkeley, even before he earned his PhD from UC Berkeley in 1984. In, yeah, in 1988, he, he came back to Berkeley as a professor, I think. In 2014, he moved to Harvard. Now he's a professor at Harvard University from both department of mathematics and the department of philosophy. Professor Wooding has made a significant contributions in many areas of mathematics and logic, but he concentrated himself on set theory, the concept of infinite. His work is, for example, the equi-consistence of Wooding cardinals and the projective determinacy, uh, the hard dichotomy the univers universality of an uh, inner model of uh, super compact cardinals are so fundamental. They have changed the whole scribing of this area. And I would al also like to mention that uh, Professor Wooding is a philosopher too. At least uh, he, published, uh, he, he published one philosophical papers. His argument against the the so-called uh, the, the generic multiverse position of mathematical truth is a model of today's philosophy of mathematics. Just as uh, Bertrand uh, Russell's classical paper on the noting, uh, these arguments show a new trend in philosophy of mathematics. That is, when you try to argue for a philosophical point of view about mathematics, you should ask for evidence from mathematics itself rather than from language, human mind, or some other things. In recent years, Professor Wooding has been advancing a program that search for ultimate inner model of large cardinals. Though it, was, it has not been finished, I believe there are tremendous work needed to do and worth to do to understand the philosophical significance of this program. So uh, let's uh, welcome Professor Hill Wooding's talk. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak at this meeting uh, celebrating the anniversary of Russell's visit to China. Okay, I'm going to be talking on the mathematical necessity of the infinite. Uh, it's going to be a math talk, but I'll try not to make too many definitions. So uh, I want to begin with formal number theory. The axioms are the piano axioms, that's PA. What are the objects? They're the natural numbers, one, two, dot, dot, dot or as a set theorist view them, zero, one, two, dot, dot, dot. But I'm gonna do the one, two, dot, dot, dot. We have the formal axioms of number theory, the piano axioms. Uh, these have the algebra axioms and the induction axiom. These are well known. And a natural question is, is all of mathematics in essence just a study of the formal consequences of these axioms? And if so, where does that leave the study of infinity? Okay, there's also a companion second order number theory, which I'll call SOPA or SOPA. Uh, the objects are the natural numbers together with all sets of natural numbers. So we have the formal axioms of second order number theory, the SOPA axioms. We have the algebra axioms, the induction axiom and the comprehension axioms. So we have two fundamental structures in mathematics. 
We have the integers with plus and times, and we have the standard structure for second order number theory, which is just the integers, all sets of integers, plus and times. And of course, we need to know which integers and which sets, so we need the epsilon relation. Okay, Fermat's last theorem, the theorem of Wiles, states that suppose uh, n is bigger than two and n is a natural number, then for all natural numbers x, y, and z, x to the n plus y to the n is not equal to z to the n. So Wiles' proof of this is considered one of the great theorems of modern mathematics. Curiously, Wiles' published proof is not even in ZFC, in set theory. And it's certainly far from a proof in second order number theory. So the natural question that's been much discussed is can Weil's theorem be proved from just the piano axioms? Well, I wanna say that's not the right question. So let's introduce a new theory, finite number theory. So the objects are the natural numbers starting with one and continuing up to some largest number. We can write down the formal axioms of finite number theory, and we'll call those FPFA, F finite. So we have the algebra axioms. Those are the axioms you would write down. But remember, plus and times aren't total. So you, the, the algebra axioms have to be reformulated to take that into account. But I do want to focus on the induction axioms. So just as with PA, this is a scheme. And it's not quite what you might have expected. So suppose F is a function on numbers and F is defined by a formal property, then the following are equivalent. The function is one-to-one, -one, that's the first property, and the second is it's a surjection. So the first one just says, if you have two different numbers, they are sent to different numbers, and the second property is saying every number is, is the value of the function somewhere. So this is sometimes called the pigeonhole principle. And you may wonder why I don't use the usual induction axiom. Well, in this context of finite number theory, it's a weaker axiom and it's not even known if it's equivalent. Okay, so for every natural number n, if we look at the numbers starting with one and ending with n, we get a model of FPFA. So we could look at the model that has only one in it. That's the simplest model. So we can work in FPFA and after a while you get used to it. And there's some interesting things. You can actually define the uh, relation Z is equal to X to the Y in FPFA. That uh, takes a little work, but it can be done. And the point of that is that Fermat's last theorem is a statement then of FPFA. Once you can define the relation Z is equal to X to the Y, you can write down the statement of Fermat. So the question is, can Weil's theorem be proved in FPFA? Now, if the answer is yes, then mathematical infinity plays absolutely no role in Weil's theorem. So this to me is the correct question. If you wanna ask, what could you prove from Weil's last theorem in? Okay, so if if you take many of the famous problems of mathematics, perhaps the most famous is the Riemann hypothesis, that can be formulated in FPFA. In fact, most of the questions can, uh, open famous open problems of number theory can be refined to problems in FPFA. And the FPFA perspective naturally generates many new questions. And so it's fair to ask, is all of mathematics really just the study of the formal consequences of FPFA? No infinity at all. Okay, so I wanna talk about Ramsey's theorem. So suppose, I have to make some definitions. Suppose N is a natural number, a set X is an N set, if X has exactly N elements. For each set Y, we'll let bracket Y n denote all the n sets such that X is a subset of Y. And now we have the famous Ramsey theorem or one version of it. It says that for every natural number n and for every natural number k bigger than n, there is a natural number m large enough so that if you take any function from the n sets from one up to m into one up to n, 
then you can find a K set on which the function's constant on all of the N subsets of A. So this is sometimes uh, stated in terms of coloring. What it says is that if you color the N sets from M with N colors, you can find a K set where the coloring is constant. People also describe this as order within chaos, because if you restrict the function pi to the N subsets of A, it's constant. It's as simple as possible. Okay, that's Ramsey's theorem, and there's an infinite version. So uh, if N is a natural number, and now we color all N sets of numbers by the numbers one up to N, then the conclusion is that there's an infinite set of numbers such that the function is constant on all of the N subsets of that infinite set. Now, Ramsey's theorem is proved in PA, and there's actually a stronger version, and that version is proved in FPFA. Uh, the infinite Ramsey theorem is proved in second order number theory. It makes no sense in FPFA. Okay, uh, the Paris Harrington theorem uh, is a slight variant of the Ramsey theorem. So here's the statement for every natural number n, there is a natural number m such that if you color the n sets from m with n colors, you can find a set on which the coloring is constant. So far, it's just Ramsey's theorem. But now there's a key additional property that A has to have. It has to have as many elements as its least member. That's the only change. So if I didn't have the third bullet, this would just be Ramsey's theorem with K equal to N plus one. But we're adding one property, and that is A also has to have, I guess the way I've stated it, more elements than its least element. Now this theorem follows easily from the infinite Ramsey theorem because an infinite set has more members than its least element. So it's a nice exercise to deduce it from the infinite Ramsey theorem to prove the Paris Harrington theorem for N, you use the infinite Ramsey theorem with, F, with N plus one. And the remarkable theorem is that the Paris-Harrington theorem cannot be proved from PA unless PA is inconsistent. So here we have an almost natural mathematical statement which can't be proved from PA, but can be proved invoking infinity. Now this was a, a theorem was a big, generated a lot of, of excitement. It's proved in the 70s. Now you can use the Paris-Harrington theorem to define Paris-Harrington numbers. And that's what I wanna do next. So suppose N is a natural number, then PHN, this is in standard notation, that's the Paris, the nth Paris-Harrington number, is the least natural number M, such that if you color the N sets from M with N colors, you can find the set A as required by the Paris-Harrington theorem. So A has to be, have at least N, has to have more than N elements, and it has to have more elements than its least member, and the coloring is constant on A. So we're looking for the least witness for the Paris-Harrington theorem for exponent N. Now, these numbers are extraordinarily large. Uh, the 10th Paris-Harrington number cannot be written in decimal notation in our universe. In fact, probably the fifth one can, or even the fourth. And these grow very fast. PH11, the 11th Paris-Harrington number, is vastly larger than the 10th Paris-Harrington number. So we can now form a, a Gödel sentence, and I'm working again in finite arithmetic. And so there's, first, we need to deal with the Paris-Harrington number. So you can write down a formula, we'll call it uh, phi sub pH or psi sub pH, and it just expresses that it's a property of X and it says there exists Y, Y is the X Paris Harrington number, and we'll say two to the two to the Y exists. Now remember, we, we can talk, talk about two to the two to the Y, so that's not a problem. It's just giving enough room. So the Gödel sense, we'll call it theta G. It's in the language of finite arithmetic. 
So it's a specific formula you can write down, and this is what it expresses. Theta G expresses that there is a proof of its negation from finite arithmetic of length less than Paris Harrington 10 and Paris Harrington 100 exists. So more precisely, size of pH 100 holds. So this is a not quite a girdle sentence because I added the second clause. So it's saying there's a proof of my negation and something big exists. Now, if you assume PA, then there's a proof of not theta G from FPFA of length less than the 11th Paris Harrington number. But how can we be certain that there's no proof from of the negation of theta G from FPFA of length less than the 10th Paris Harrington number? And why should we care? Well, wait, if you had a proof of length less than uh, the 10th Paris Harrington number, then the 100th Paris Harrington number can't exist. You'd have a contradiction. So if we had a proof of FPFA of length less than the 10th Paris Harrington number, we have falsified large finite. In particular, we falsified the infinite. So we don't want to find such a sentence. So how can we secure the finite? Well, there's no proof of not theta G from FPFA of length less than uh, the 10th Paris Harrington number. That's a theorem from PA. But why does this imply that there's no proof of not theta G from FPFA of length less than the 10th Paris Harrington number. Maybe PA is inconsistent. All right, so we want to work on a weaker theory. Well, FPFA plus the 101 Paris Harrington number exists does prove that there's no proof of not theta G from FPFA of length less than the 10th Paris Harrington number. But this isn't really helping. Maybe Paris Harrington 101 can't exist. So the real question is, how do we know we cannot find by any physical or mathematical means a proof of, the, of not theta G from FPFA of length, say, less than 10 to the 24th, something we could verify if we could find it, or that we cannot find accessible, verifiable evidence which converts to a proof of not theta G from FPFA of length less than pH 10? Maybe we have a more efficient notion of proof. Well, if, if we could find it, we would falsify the large finite, we'd falsify the infinite, we'd wipe out all of mathematics. Now you might say, well, clearly it doesn't exist, but notice you can't use uh, pH 50 to show that it doesn't exist. And pH 50 is enormously large, much, it, it the, FPFA with the assumption that pH 50 exists is an incredibly powerful theory for the finite. So there's no evidence in our world that such a, a proof of not theta G uh, can't exist. Okay, well, one way you could secure the finite is to secure the infinite, right? If the finite's in jeopardy, can lead to a contradiction, then it should be easier to find the contradiction if you look at the infinite. So the simplest setting for the study of the infinite is second order number theory. And we have the axioms, the SOPA axioms. So we could ask, can we answer the basic questions of second order number theory using the SOPA axioms and thereby show that the conception of arbitrary sets of natural numbers makes sense and therefore increase our confidence in the finite by increasing our confidence in the infinite. So uh, I wanted to find the projective sets. Uh, the standard structure for second order number theory is the power set of the integers, the integers plus times and membership. This structure is really the structure of the real numbers with plus and times together with a collection of simply defined sets of real numbers. These are the projective sets of real numbers. And there are two equivalent ways to define the projective sets. You can do it the logical way. You view the reals as contained in the power set of N 
And you consider those sets of reals, which can be logically defined in the structure for second order number theory from parameters. That's the logic, the logician's way. But you can also define the projective sets just using calculus. So you consider all the sets of real numbers, which can be generated from the open sets in finitely many steps uh, using the operations complement and taking the image by a continuous function. So those are pretty simple operations. They're standard, you know, the, the continuous function is a standard notion in calculus, as is an open set. Okay, so we have our objects now. What are our questions? Well, we can define projective subsets of the plane in exactly the same two equivalent ways. And then once we have that, we can localize the axiom of choice to the projective sets. And we'll call this the projective axiom of choice. So suppose X is a subset of the plane and X is projective. Suppose it has a property that for every real number R, there exists a real number S such that the pair RS belongs to X. So that says that X touches every vertical line. Then there exists a projective subset of X with that same property. For every R, there exists an S such that RS belongs to Y. So Y touches every vertical line. But Y also has the property that for all real numbers R, S, and T, if R, S belongs to Y and R, T belongs to Y, then S equals T. In other words, Y is a function. So it says that you can choose one point in every vertical section. So all I've done is take an instance of done is take an instance of the axiom of choice, uh, namely for localized to the reals, but we're restricting our objects to the projective sets. So the axiom of choice tells us that Y exists, but it doesn't tell us that we can find Y to be projective. So we've simplified the problem by only looking at projective sets, but we've made the solution harder to find because we require that the solution also be a projective set. Well, we can do the same thing with the continuum hypothesis. So if we have two projective sets of real numbers, X and Y, we have the notion of a projective function from X to Y. It's simply a function whose graph is a projective subset of the plane. And with that, we can now define the projective continuum hypothesis. Suppose X is an infinite projective set, then one of the following holds. There's either a, a projective bijection of the natural numbers with X, or there's a projective bijection of the real numbers with X. So again, if we had the continuum hypothesis, we would know that X has cardinality N or N X has cardinality R, but here, the witnesses for that are required to be projective. So again, we've both made the problem uh, easier and harder. So by the time of Russell's visit to China, the two problems, the problems of the projective axiom of choice and the projective continuum hypothesis, which were studied in the early 1900s, were considered hopeless. Uh, it's basically Luzon's comment in 1925. They had some success, but they just ran into a wall. And of course, we know now why. The problems are unsolvable. So by results of Gödel and by Cullen, both of the problems given by the projective axiom of choice and the projective continuum hypothesis are formally unsolvable on the basis of the axioms of second order number theory. In fact, the two problems are each unsolvable on the basis of the ZFC axioms of set theory. So they are really unsolvable. But one could hope that all is not lost. Maybe uh, these questions can be answered by sharpening our conception of second order number theory. Maybe we just don't have all the axioms. Okay, so let's introduce the notion of a projective frame. This is not a standard notion, it's just for this talk. A projective frame is an extension of the formal SOPA axioms, which provides a complete description of the standard structure of second order number theory. This extension should be specified by at most a recursive set of formal axioms, maybe a finite set added to the SOPA axioms. 
The important thing is that this extension should be immune to Cohen's method. More precisely, that Cohen's method cannot be used to show that questions are unsolvable on the basis of the projective frame. So I'm not gonna say much about Cohen's method, but Cohen's method is the main source that challenges our conception of the universe of sets or even of second order number theory. So there's the girdle frame. There's a projective frame given by Girdle's axiom V is equal to L, this I will call the girdle frame. The girdle frame implies the projective continuum hypothesis and the girdle frame implies the projective axiom of choice. But there are other projective frames. The PD frame. This is the projective frame given by the Michelsky Steinhaus axiom of determinacy. The PD frame implies the projective continuum hypothesis and the PD frame implies the projective axiom of choice. So now it looks a little bit like the girdle frame perhaps. But there's a stronger version of the projective continuum hypothesis. And we'll call this a strong projective continuum hypothesis. Uh, it asserts that if you have an infinite projective set and X is not countable, then X contains an uncountable closed subset. So a large set contains a large simple set. And uh, it's pretty easy to show that the strong projective continuum hypothesis implies the projective continuum hypothesis. It's basically the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem, uh, but they're not equivalent statements. We could also uh, projectify the well-ordering principle and, and form the projective well-ordering principle. And that simply asserts that there's a projective well-ordering of the reals. Remember that a well-ordering is a linear ordering where every subset that's not empty has a least element. So the standard order on the real numbers is not a well-ordering. Now the projective well-ordering principle implies the projective axiom of choice, just as the well-ordering principle implies the axiom of choice. But we'll see that the converse is not true. The projective well-ordering principle refutes the strong projective continuum hypothesis. So now we have divergent projective frames. So Girdle really showed, assume the Girdle frame, then the projective well-ordering principle holds. That's how Girdle was able to prove the projective axiom of choice. Davis showed that if you assume the PD frame, then the strong projective continuum hypothesis holds. In particular, the projective well-ordering principle does not hold. So the frames are very different. Well, in fact, there are many, many uh, projective frames. There's a bewildering array of divergent projective frames. Many other projective frames have been discovered. Cohen's method actually yields projective frames in which the projective axiom of choice fails and the projective continuum hypothesis fails. But for 25 years, the PD frame remained in essence the only projective frame known in which the projective axiom of choice holds and the strong projective continuum hypothesis holds. And that led to a conjecture that the PD frame is implied by those two consequences. That if you have the projective axiom of choice and you have the strong projective continuum hypothesis, then you must be in the PD frame. That would help form a basis for selecting the PD frame. Remember, we're trying to sharpen our conception of second order number theory. But in the 80s, a new class of projective frames was discovered. And the theorem is that assume the PD frame is consistent, then there are projective frames in which the strong projective continuum hypothesis holds, the PD frame is false, and by a theorem of steel, the projective axiom of choice holds. So that conjecture does not hold. So it looks like our attempt to understand second order number theory and this is the first step into the infinite really, is failing. All we have is a whole bunch of options. For it to succeed, we have to be able to identify the one true projective frame among the ever expanding and bewildering array of projective frames. So it looks like we're not in the right setting. We have no way to choose one of these frames over any other one. So we need to change our perspective 
And the pers key for new perspective is going to be set theory. So set theory begins with the transfinite numbers or the ordinals. So the empty set is the smallest ordinal, that's zero. The set whose only member is the empty set is the next ordinal, that's one. The next set is two. The set that has the empty set and the other set in it. If alpha is an ordinal, then alpha is just a set of all ordinals that are smaller than alpha. Alpha plus one, that's the next largest ordinal, is the ordinal you get by adding alpha to alpha. Okay, so the ordinals measure lengths of well orderings. That's, that's why they're numbers. Omega denotes the least infinite ordinal. It's a set of all finite ordinals. So now we come to the universe of sets. So if X is a set, the power set of X is the collection of all subsets of that set and it's denoted P of X. And in a transfinite uh, construction, we can unravel the universe of sets defining the cumulative hierarchy of sets. So the universe of sets is generated by defining V alpha by induction on alpha. V zero is as simple as possible. It's the empty set. V alpha plus one, that's a successor step. It's just take the power set of V alpha, but we have other stages. Those are the limit stages. If alpha is a limit ordinal, then V alpha is just a union of all the smaller V betas, all the V betas for beta less than alpha. So every set appears. That's a consequence of the axioms. If X is a set, then X belongs to V alpha for some alpha. In fact, if you take this conception for the universe of sets, you're naturally led uh, to the axioms for set theory. So you can look at these, uh, V0 is empty, there's V1, there's V2, V3 has four elements, V4 has 16 elements, V5 has 65,536 elements. These are getting big fast. V omega is infinite and it's uh, the set of all hereditarily finite sets. Now, what's interesting, if you look at V omega as a structure where with membership, that's mathematically identical to the structure of number theory. Each structure can be interpreted in the other. If we go one more step and look at V omega plus one, that's mathematically identical to the structure for second order number theory. Each structure can be interpreted in the other. So we get the two canonical structures of mathematics at the first two level, infinite levels of the V alpha hierarchy. Oh, we have the basic axioms and beyond, large cardinal axioms. The ZFC axioms are the accepted basic axioms for set theory. I will not define those. So the analog of the PA axioms for the universe of sets, or if you want the analog of the SOPA axioms for second order number theory. The ZFC axioms are naturally augmented by additional axioms, which assert the existence of very large infinite sets. And these axioms uh, insert the existence of large cardinals. So these large cardinals include in order of increasing strength, not in order of discovery, inaccessible cardinals, measurable cardinals, and then it goes on. Strong cardinals, wooden cardinals, super compact, extendable, huge, axiom I zero card. There are many other large cardinal notions. Uh, axiom I zero cardinal is among the largest large cardinal notion that has been discovered to date. In set theory, uh, logical definability plays a very important role. We've already seen that. That's how we define the projective sets in the logician's way, but we can do that for any set. So for every set X, P def, and this is for definable power set, denotes the set of all subsets of X, call it Ys, which are logically defined in X with parameters from X. So you view X as a structure with a membership relation and you just do logical definability. So B, a P def of X is a collection of just those subsets of X which are intrinsic to X itself. You don't need to look outside. Now the power set of X depends upon the ambient universe of sets. So these are very different uh, operations in general. The collection of all projective sets of real numbers is exactly the definable power set of V omega plus one intersect the power of the reals. 
So using the definable power set, one can alter the definition of the cumulative hierarchy. And this is what Gödel did when he defined L. So let me remind you about the cumulative hierarchy. It's the transfinite iteration of the power set operation and every set is eventually generated. So what we're gonna do is take that definition and just alter uh, the second line. So we define the L alphas by induction on alpha. We start the same way, L0 is the empty set, but now at a successor step, we don't take the power set, we take the definable power set, that intrinsic power set. And at limit stages, we take unions. And then L is the class of all sets X, such that X belongs to L alpha for some alpha. And so now we have an axiom, V is equal to L. And it's simply the axiom that every set belongs to L alpha for some ordinal alpha. And Gödel showed that if you assume V is equal to L, then the continuum hypothesis holds. That's how Gödel showed that the continuum hypothesis was consistent with the axioms of set theory. Now the axiom V is equal to L implies the Gödel frame. Remember the Gödel frame was just talking about the projective sets. Now adopting the axiom V is equal to L completely negates the ramifications of Cohen's method. Cohen's method cannot be used to show unsolvability on the basis of the axiom V is equal to L. And remember Cohen's method, which I haven't talked about, is the main source of ambiguity in our conception of sets. Well, what about large cardinals? Now the axiom that there is a measurable cardinal is a fundamental large cardinal axiom. And Scott, and this is proved before Cohen, assume there's a measurable cardinal and V is not L. So before Scott's theorem, it might have, one didn't know that you couldn't just prove V is equal to L from the axioms of set theory. And Scott's theorem says you probably can't, or you can't. More remarkably, a few years later, Robotten proved that if there's a measurable cardinal, then the Gödel frame is false. What's remarkable about Robotten's theorem is that it's saying that the existence of a measurable cardinal, which is saying some very large set exists, is giving you information about small sets. Because remember, the Gödel frame is about small sets. It's about sets of integers. Scott's theorem is, is not of that form. So the conception of V, the universe of sets entails rejecting the Gödel frame because we have to have large cardinals, we have to have everything. So what about the other projective frames? We now have a means to reject the Gödel frame, but there are all those other frames. Well, there was an unexpected and perfect alignment. It began with the theorem of Martin and Steele from 35 years ago now. Assume there are infinitely many wooden cardinals then the PD frame holds. But something much better happens. But this tells us that the PD frame is, well, this and the next theorem tell us that the PD frame is the one true projective frame. Here's the alignment. The PD frame is equivalent to the theory of second order number theory as given by the ZFC axioms with the axioms there exist n many wooden cardinals for each natural number n. So we have an exact alignment. So we have a new truth of FPFA. The PD frame is consistent. So within second order number theory, we can define the P PD frame. I basically did, but we don't know it's a consistent frame. Now we can say it's a consistent frame because it's true. But the consistency of the PD frame, that's a statement of FPFA. So here I'll make a prediction that this claim that this PD frame is consistent will not have been falsified by the thousandth anniversary of Russell's visit to China. But has this success really secured the infinite? The PD frame is secured by the conception of V, but this is only by enlarging the scope of investigation from that of second order number theory to V itself. So this then demands one transition from considering projective frames to V frames. We had no basis within second order number theory to argue for the PD frame. It was only by moving to set theory that we generated that basis. But then we have to understand the new arena. So we need V frames. 
So the question is, is there a, an expansion of the ZFC axioms, which yields a conception of the universe of sets, which is both immune to Cohen's method and compatible with all large cardinal axioms. That is for which there's no generalization of Scott's theorem. Up to about 15 years ago, this seemed completely hopeless. I mean, how would you even show that there's no generalization without identifying all large cardinal axioms, which you can never do? But uh, that was based on a misconception. So I'm gonna get a little more technical now to make a number of definitions, but I'm gonna lead you to what is the candidate for the V-frame. So it begins with the ultimate generalization of the projective sets. And it's a definition of Fang, Magador, and myself. Uh, I'm not gonna explain this. I'm just giving the definition. I'm generalizing on the uh, calculus way of defining the projective sets. So a set of reals is universally bare if for all topological spaces omega, for all continuous functions from omega to the reals, the pre-image of A by pi has a property of bare in the space omega. So those are fundamental notions in analysis. It's, it's, assume there's a proper class of wooden cardinals and every projective set is universally bare. And the Martin Steele theorem is really, assume there's a proper class of wooden cardinals and every universally bare set is determined. So the PV frame generalizes to all the universally bare sets. And there's a key difference here. The projective sets are generated from the reals. The universally bare sets are generated from the universe of sets. So the other component in the new in the V frame involves relativizing Gödel's construction of L to sets of reals. The only difference is that in the first step. So if A is a set of reals, we define L alpha of A and R by induction on alpha. L zero of A and R is just V omega plus one together with A. That's the only change. Remember before L zero was the empty set. And then we just iterate taking definable power sets and successor steps and unions at limit stages. And then L of A and R is a class of all sets such that X belongs to L alpha for some alpha. And the reason that we're bringing this in besides I will need it is that we get the following theorem. Assume there's a proper class of wooden cardinals, suppose A is universally bare, then every set we can generate from A using uh, the definition of L of A and R is universally bare. And so L of A and R models uh, the axiom of determinacy, in fact, by the Martin Steele theorem. Okay, the next uh, component in this V frame is Gödel's class OD. So OD is for ordinal definable, is the class of all sets X such that there exists an ordinal alpha such that X belongs to V alpha and X is definable in V alpha. Now this isn't exactly how Gödel defined it. This is really a theorem, but for our purposes, it uh, works as a definition, quite elegant in fact. It says every set's definable somewhere. The definition of OD does not use the axiom of choice. Nowhere in that definition uh, involves the axiom of choice. And curiously, uh, and this was Gödel's point, the axiom V is equal to OD implies the axiom of choice. So this gives a completely different perspective on the axiom of choice in terms of definability, not in terms of the well-ordering principle. It also pushes back on the skeptical, the skepticism on the axiom of choice, which usually goes like this. I don't believe the reals can be well-ordered. Show me a well-ordering of the reals. But that requires that there be a real that's not definable in any V alpha. So show me a real that's not definable in any V alpha. Because if every real is definable in some V alpha, I'll show you a definable well-ordering of the reals. Okay, for the next thing, I just recall a notion, a set's transitive if every element is a subset of the set. That's like an initial segment of the universe. Each V alpha is a transitive set. If M is a finite transitive set, it belongs to V omega, and V omega is simply the union of all the finite transitive sets. So with the transitive set and OD, we can define hot. 
how does the class of all sets X such that there is a transitive set M such that X belongs to M and both M it belongs to OD and M is a subset of OD. So we're cutting something out of OD. If V is equal to OD, then HOD is equal to V. And that's the usual formulation of the axiom V is equal to HOD. Uh, one can show that the axiom of choice holds in HOD. Every set that's in HOD can be well-ordered uh, and that well-ordering is in HOD. So we can now relativize this. If we have a set of reals, we let HOD L of A and R the hot is defined within L of A and R. So that's easily done. We first define OD L of A and R. It's a class of all X and L of A and R, such that for some ordinal alpha, X is definable not in V alpha, but in V alpha intersect L of A and R. And then we can get hot L of A and R from OD L of A and R exactly as we got hot from OD. So now we have all the pieces in place and I can define the candidate axiom, V is ultimate L. So first, let me make a comment. Assume there's a proper class of wooden cardinals. If A is a set of reals and A is universally bare, then L of A is not equal to the hot of L of A and R. Well, why? Well, the axiom of choice fails in L of A and R because the determinacy axiom holds and the axiom of choice has to hold in the hot of L of A and R. So we have L of A and R, and we in this case know that the hot of L of A and R must be smaller. So here is the axiom for V is ultimate L. The first axiom, part of the axiom is there's a proper class of wooden cardinals. That just says for every ordinal alpha, there's a wooden cardinal delta, such that delta is bigger than alpha. I'm not gonna define wooden cardinals. Uh, for each sentence phi, this is the second part of the axiom. For each sentence phi, if phi holds in V alpha for some ordinal alpha, then there's a universally bare set A such that in hot of L of A and R, phi holds in V alpha for some alpha. So it's a reflection of something happening in V into something happening in one of the models hot of L of A and R. So that's the axiom. And in fact, I've defined everything in this axiom except for wooden cardinals. So it's not a terribly complicated axiom. There's a key difference though, between the axiom V is equal to L. In the case of L, you define the construction of L and then get the axiom V is equal to L. There's no construction here, it's just the axiom. So this is really kind of a prediction. We don't know how to construct the model yet. But, uh, because of the coupling with the axiom determinacy, we can, we can use the machinery that's been developed in the study of AD to get consequences from this axiom. So the first consequence, if you assume V is ultimate L, the continuum hypothesis holds. That's not so hard, well, that's a theorem. Much harder is assume V is ultimate L, then V is equal to hot. Uh, if you adopt the axiom V as ultimate L, it completely negates the ramifications of Cohen's method. So ZFC plus the one axiom V as ultimate L is a V frame. It's immune to Cohen's method. In fact, it's the ultimate generalization of the girdle frame to a V frame. But now we, we've been here before. And we have to ask the key question, is there a generalization of Scott's theorem for the axiom V is ultimate L? Because if there is, we have to reject the axiom. And how could we even hope to show there isn't? Well, it turns out there is a way. So uh, I have to make some more definitions. So I have to talk about the modern language for large cardinals. Remember, those are those axioms asserting the existence of very large sets. And the basic language involves elementary embeddings, which is a logical notion. Suppose X and Y are transitive sets and we have a function J from X to Y. It's an elementary embedding if it preserves truth. So you take any formula in the language of set theory, take any elements from X and you get X thinks that formula holds at those elements if and only if Y thinks the formula holds at the image of those elements. So the function preserves truth. 
So if, if, if J were the identity and X is equal to Y, that would certainly be uh, an elementary embedding. That would be trivial. Okay, so we're gonna be interested in more complicated transitive sets. So suppose we have an elementary embedding from V alpha to V beta. Then the following are equivalent. J is not the identity. And the second is that there's an ordinal, so, so J of eta is not equal to eta. So the critical point of J denotes the least ordinal such that J of eta is not equal to eta. We're not gonna be interested in uh, elementary embeddings that are the identity. So Reinhardt, 45 years ago, introduced the notion of an extendable cardinal. Suppose delta is a cardinal, delta is an extendable cardinal if for every lambda bigger than delta, there's an elementary embedding from J from V lambda plus one to VJ of lambda plus one, critical point of J is equal to delta and J of delta is bigger than lambda. So it's a kind of push up. I need one more notion, inner models. So a transitive class is an inner model if it contains the ordinals and all the axioms of ZFC hold in M. So a transitive class, every element of the class is a subset of the class. So the ordinals are a transitive class, but the ordinals are not an inner model. Now, since I'm gonna be talking about classes, we have to be a little bit careful. Uh, it's understood that classes have to be definable in V from parameters. Classes aren't elements of V. It's so like a number theory. You can talk about sets of numbers and we talk about sets of numbers which are definable like the sets of primes or the sets of twin primes. Unfortunately, stating that M is a model of ZSC is not a legal thing we can say because it refers to truth. So there's a meta lemma that, that reformulates that into something that we can say. So if M is a transitive class containing the ordinals, then the following are equivalent. M is an inner model, M model ZFC, that thing we're not allowed to say. And the second thing is the equivalence is the following hold. M intersect V alpha is an element of M for all alpha. I'm allowed to say that, I just said it. And for every set X and M, the definable power set of X is an M. So again, the definable power set is playing a role. So L and HOD are inner models. And for every set A, contained in the reals, the HOD of L of A and R is an inner model. Now I'm requiring inner models satisfy the axiom of choice. So in general, L of A and R is not an inner model, it's an inner model of ZF. So uh, we now need some notion of closeness. And this was introduced uh, by Hampkins about almost 20 years ago now. And these are the delta cover and approximation properties. Suppose N, is an inner model and delta is an uncountable regular cardinal, then delta has, N has a delta cover property. If, you if for all sigma contained in N, if the cardinality of sigma is less than delta, then there's a set tau in N, such that sigma is a subset of tau and the cardinality of tau is less than delta. So the slogan is small sets are covered by small sets in N. There's no assumption here that sigma is an N, otherwise it would be trivial. And small just means of size less than delta. Well, there's a companion property and that's the approximation property. N has a delta approximation property if for all sets X contained in N, the following are equivalent. X is in N and the second clause, the second property is for every sigma in N, if the cardinality of sigma is less than delta, then sigma intersect X is an N. So the approximation property is if your small approximations are in N, then you're in N. And the first one just says small sets are covered by small sets. Now, what was the motivation for these? Well, if V is an extension of an inner model by Cohen's method, then N has a delta approximation property and the delta cover property for all sufficiently large regular cardinals delta. Uh, I guess I should point out, why do we want delta to be uncountable? Why not consider the case of omega? Well, every inner model has the omega cover property 
And if an inner model has the omega approximation property, it must be V. So if you try to do it for omega, it becomes trivial and uninteresting. Okay, so uh, Hamkins proved two theorems. Suppose N0 and N1 both have the delta approximation property and the delta cover property. Then the following are equivalent. N0 equals N1. N0 intersect the power set of delta plus equals N1 intersect the power set of delta plus. In other words, if you have two models, inner models with the delta approximation and cover property, if they have the same subsets of delta plus, they must be the same model. So this shows that, or the proof shows that uh, inner models of the delta approximation property and the delta cover property are necessarily definable classes. Remember, we wanted to restrict to definable classes as necessary. Hamkins also proved something else. Suppose N is an inner model with the delta cover and approximation properties. Suppose kappa is bigger than delta and kappa is an extendable cardinal. Then kappa is an extendable cardinal in N. Well, that's quite interesting. And the theorem holds for all the large cardinals on the list that I gave, except the strongest one the axiom I zero cardinals. So these are the universality theorems. Basically, if you have an inner model with a delta cover and approximation property, large cardinals in V above delta go down to N as large cardinals in N, except of course for the largest one. And there it's false. The theorem fails in the case that kappa is an axiom I zero cardinal. We need another property. And that's the delta genericity property. So suppose N is an inner model and sigma is a subset of N, then N bracket sigma is the smallest inner model M that contains M and sigma. N bracket sigma always exists. So suppose N is an inner model and delta is strongly inaccessible. That just means two to the kappa is less than delta for all kappa less than delta and delta is regular. So omega is strongly inaccessible. Then N has a delta genericity property for all sigma contained in delta. If the cardinality of sigma is less than delta, then N bracket sigma intersect V delta is a Cohen extension of N intersect V delta. So it looks like I'm cheating, I'm bringing in Cohen, but that's okay. And then we have the strong universality theorem. Suppose that N has a delta approximation property, the delta cover property, and the delta genericity property. Suppose the axiom I zero holds at lambda for a proper class of lambda, then in N, the axiom I zero holds at lambda for a proper class of lambda. So, this is an indication that we really need the three properties. And there are other theorems that make the same case. So we have three properties, cover, approximation, and genericity. Well, now we can state a conjecture. And this is the ultimate L conjecture. Suppose that delta is an extendable cardinal, then provably there's an inner model N such that N has a delta cover and delta approximation properties N has a delta genericity property, and N satisfies the axiom V is ultimate L. So this is a conjecture of set theory, right? Because we can talk about inner models with approximation and cover. Now, the ultimate L conjecture is an existential number theoretic statement. Notice the conjecture says provably there is. So that says ZFC plus delta is extendable proves something. So it's an existential number theoretic statement. If it's undecidable, it must be false. The ultimate L conjecture must be either true or false. It can't be meaningless. It can't be like CH. So set theory faces one of two futures. The ultimate L conjecture reduces the entire post Cohen debate on set theoretic truth to a single question which must have an answer, reduces it to an existential number theoretic statement. What's the first future? The ultimate L conjecture is true. Then the axiom V is ultimate L is very likely the key missing axiom for V. By the, there's no generalization of the Scott's theorem for the axiom V is ultimate L by the strong universality theorem. That was the whole point 
of bringing in approximation cover and generosity. One can also say that all the questions which have been shown to be unsolvable by Cohen's method are resolved modulo large cardinal axiom. So if the ultimate L conjecture is true and you assume V is ultimate L, the only ambiguity in V is the height of V. In other words, what large cardinals exist. The reason V is ultimate L is immune to Cohen's method is that Cohen's method is a way of altering the width of the universe. But if you're gonna maintain V as ultimate L, you can't alter width without altering height. And that's why Cohen's method is useless in the context of V as ultimate L. What's the other future? The other future is that the ultimate L conjecture is false. In this case, the program to understand V by generalizing the success and understanding V omega plus one and the projective sets failed. Which is it? So that's where we are. Uh, it's a, we know so much about the ultimate L conjecture now, there are many paths to trying to show it's true and there are many paths to trying to show that it's false. So it will get resolved and uh, it's a cliffhanger. So, so if it's true, we have the V frame, so we've completed the task that we secured the infinite, arguably. I mean, if it's true, that's success in our understanding of V beyond anything that seemed possible 30 years ago. The idea that you could add one axiom to V that crystallizes out V always seemed impossible, but that was based on a misconception. If the ultimate L conjecture is false, then we have to start all over again and trying to understand the infinite. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you, Hugh. So great talk. So I, do I stop yeah. my share? Sorry. And now we have a uh, half an hour for discussion. And okay, do I, I, so I, I stop know. sharing? Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. So, any questions, any remarks, any comments? That's a very nice talk. Yeah, okay. Oh, I, I, I saw. Q, I, I, I saw a, a question on the Q and answer. I'm sorry, I go to the Q and answer? Yeah. And we okay. go to Abtel and Paisish. Do Am I supposed to type my answer or do my answer live? You just see it, I think. Okay, so it's not known. Um, it's uh, in part because we don't uh, have the construction of ultimate L. If, you, if we were able to prove the ultimate L conjecture, that would give a construction of ultimate L and that would show that it implies GCH. There's very strong evidence that it implies GCH. What's known is it implies GCH up to the least measurable cardinal and a bit more. Okay, it's just the way it's stated, uh, you're looking basically at the HOD of an arbitrary AD plus model, that's the L of A and R model. And the, really the question is whether GCH holds in that hot, and it's known in many cases, but until you have the full analysis, we don't know. Yeah, so we don't know the GCH, but we know a lot, we, again, up to the first measurable cardinal, we do know the GCH. Okay. Another more. Um, I will make the slides available. Uh, I'll send them to Professor Wang after the, we're done. So if you, do you believe that the physical universe is finite? <laughs> um, well, I believe my experience of it is finite. Um, uh, that's what the physicists say. They say it's finite. Yeah, because uh, you, you use it the, 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 the age pH 11 is much longer oh. than the digits yeah. of the Well, universe. so if, 
it's um, if the string theorists are right, it's much larger than anything you could ever represent in the universe. I mean, okay. pH 11 is much bigger than Ackerman. I mean, it's a big number. Mm -hmm. um, uh, pH probably, I mean, I didn't do the sit down and think about it, but I bet pH four is really, really big. Okay. Uh, so the point of that girdle sentence is uh, F in the setting of finite number theory, uh, what plays the role of large cardinals are the axioms that assert the existence of specific numbers. So pH 10 exists as a large cardinal axiom in finite number theory. Remember finite number theory has no existence theorems at all. All you know that exists is one. Mm -hmm. um, so if you take a, uh, if you take that girdle sentence, you can't use pH 50 to help show that that proof doesn't exist. Otherwise mm -hmm. you have a contradiction. And if you take finite number theory with pH 50 exists, that seems like a very rich setting. And all you're looking asking about is strings of length pH 10, which is infinitely mm -hmm. smaller than pH 50. So, um, So I see there are more questions. Yes. Um, well, the difference between the ultimate L approach is it's not just concerned with CH, it's concerned with V itself and uh, all the questions. So uh, you can believe as, some many set theorists do that CH has a determinant of truth value, but we're interested in finding that value. I mean, you can, uh, if, you are, if you assume that the universe of sets is a meaningful conception, then all set theoretic statements have a truth value. But uh, maybe those are truth values we can never discover or understand, in which case saying it has a determinant of truth value doesn't really add anything. So the challenge in set theory, I think, is to deal with the independence that's the legacy of Cohen. Cohen has created a, created a powerful technique for generating ambiguity in the universe of sets, the width extensions. And the question is, can one come to a conception of the universe of sets that's immune to that? Well, V is equal to L is such a conception but we have to reject it because of large cardinals. So the real question is, is there something like V is equal to L, which is immune to Cohen's method? And there's no example known, even ad hoc, so, except for possibly the V is ultimate L axiom. So that's a, that has a candidate. We know it's immune to Cohen's method. We can prove that now but we don't know whether we're gonna be forced to reject the axiom because maybe axiom I zero cardinals imply V is not ultimate L or maybe an extendable cardinal implies V is not ultimate L. So if infinity forces us to reject the axiom, then we have to reject it and we have to find another, then we have no candidate for an axiom that uh, is immune to Cohen's method. So, I mean, that's the issue. The issue is, uh, uh, okay, so the next one is the Pmax axiom question. Well, uh, well, obviously they are in the Pmax axiom is this canonical axiom in which the issue for the sets of reals which implies CH is false, implies the continuum is Aleph two. Um, uh, obviously that contradicts V is ultimate L. The trouble with the Pmax axiom is that it doesn't give you any understanding for uh, beyond sets of reals. Um, now there's a, a remarkable recent theorem. So there's a competitor, there was a competitor to the Pmax axiom. And this is a whole nother line to generate axioms with the forcing axioms, the Martin's maximum. 
Uh, about a year ago, Aspero and Schindler showed that the Pmax axiom is implied by Martin's maximum in the plus plus form. And so that's a remarkable convergence. But there's a footnote. Uh, there's a generalization of the Pmax axiom. So the Pmax axiom is usually called the star axiom. There's the star plus axiom and the star plus plus axiom, which I will not define. So last summer I showed these axioms are the same equivalent, the star plus and the star plus plus. And as a corollary of that proof, uh, I also showed that if you look at all the known models of Martin's maximum, the star plus axiom fails. So before the Sparrow Schindler result, it wasn't known whether the star axiom can hold with Martin, whether it holds in some of the MM models or all of them. Well, with the star plus axiom, we now know it fails in all the known models. But the star plus axiom gives a rich structure to the power of the reals. The star axiom just gives a rich structure to the power of omega one. So now we have a competitor axiom, I mean, we have a collision. Uh, the motivation from Martin's axiom is based on maximality. There's an analogous uh, uh, maximality argument for the star plus axiom. And these, these are likely going to collide. So um, again, V is ultimate L as an axiom gives much more information about the universe of sets than the star axiom or even the forcing axioms. The forcing axioms look like they're giving you a lot of information, but they're not really. They're not answering fundamental questions. There are things independent of the forcing axioms, which the forcing axioms cannot settle or very likely. So, um, so I'm not quite sure. So uh, Cohen's method can be applied for V omega plus one, though that's not what you normally do. You apply it to V and change V omega plus one within V. Okay, so, um, uh, because uh, there are not many forcings in V omega plus one that you could use um, for Cohen forcings. Um, so the uh, robustness of the PD frame is actually in the ambient universe of sets. If, if you have a proper class of wooden cardinals and you do any width extension by Cohen's method, well, you can certainly create new reals but you can't change the theory of second order number theory. It is immune to Cohen's method. You can change what objects there are, but you can't change their properties. So the theory of second order number theory is unaffected by Cohen's method. I mean, the PD frame is unaffected by Cohen's method. This is now in the setting of a universe of sets with a proper class of wooden cardinals. So in that sense, it's a very uh, canonical uh, frame. But you don't see that. There's, the point I was trying to make was that if your view is second order number theory, if that's your universe, there is no basis that you can cite on why you should choose the PD frame. You have all these other frames. For all you know, the PD frame is inconsistent. So which frame do you pick? In that setting, you can't seem to make a choice. It's only by moving to V that you can make the choice and you see that the PD frame is the true frame. But when you make that move to V, well, then you should be talking about V frames. We're trying to secure the infinite. If we move to a more complicated setting to secure a lesser notion of infinity, is that really doing anything? unless we can uh, secure the expanded notion of infinity. So that's why one's forced to consider V frames. And that's why, I mean, it's a little bit like, at least to me, and I'll be somewhat controversial here. I don't think the assertion that PD is true makes any sense, except as within a universe of sets where you have large cardinals. Okay, there's a. Okay. Uh, so I'm looking at a. a 
Well, so uh, Hampkins, uh, Hampkins is my student, former student, and students rebel. Uh, so Hampkins is rebelling against me. That's good. Uh, he argues that, or he has, he has a, actually a very extreme multiverse conception, not just a multiverse conception for sets, but a much broader multiverse conception. Um, it's a funny thing to me, uh, the resistance to the conception of V. It's, it's a set theorist, much of the energy and research that's been going on in set theory for the last 50 years is in independence. It's basically studying the generic multiverse. Um, but that's not studying V. That's the model theory of set theory, I would say. I'm being a little bit uh, controversial here. Uh, now it can help you discover aspects to V. So when I was a graduate student, projective determinacy was thought to be stronger than all large cardinals. I remember my advisor, Solovey, telling me that. So there was a fundamental misconception in the relationship between determinacy and large cardinals. And that resolution, the, under, the realization that it was a misconception came from forcing methods. It came from exploring the landscape of possibilities for sets, for universes of sets. So exploring the uh, model theory of set theory, if you will, can be an important tool in guiding your intuitions about the universe of sets. But it is a different subject. It's the model theory of set theory. Set theory should be about V, or at least about whether we, there is a V. Now, you could, if you take the view that there is no V, so a multiverse conception, first of all, why take that view unless there are reasons to take that view? How does it help understand anything? It's giving up. It's just saying that uh, there's no V or that if there is a V, we can never understand it. Now, maybe that's the way, but we didn't, we're not there yet. And there's a conjecture on the table, this ultimate L conjecture. There's a program to prove that conjecture. It's not like it's a hopeless conjecture. And if one can prove that conjecture, then one really has a candidate for a V frame. And maybe then uh, transfinite mathematics can really get started. The trouble in set theory now is almost any question you ask is unsolvable. How do you develop a rich mathematical structure when all the questions are unsolvable? You wanna study a given structure and find truths about that structure. If the questions are unsolvable, you're not studying a structure, you're studying possible structures. That's a different subject. So I think that it's too early to give up on the universe of sets. There were fundamental misconceptions about why there could be no ultimate L. We now see uh, that it's possible that there be an ultimate L. We have a conjecture uh, and we have a path toward proving that conjecture. Now, you know, I, I really think this is gonna get resolved in the not too distant future. Uh, it's a cliffhanger, uh, but there are ways to refute the ultimate L conjecture and there are ways to prove it. It's not like we don't know what to do. And one can debate, you know, do you have to choose which side you wanna work on and pursue it. But until it's had a chance, I think disregarding uh, the idea that there might be a V is premature. I mean, if, if the ultimate L conjecture is true, you have a true candidate for a V frame. You have a setting for rich mathematics where things are not gonna be independent except for height. So you ask basic questions about sets you're gonna resolve them. They're not, there's no Cohen method that can uh, be applied to ultimate L. 
just like there's no Cohen method for number theory. So ZFC plus the axiom V is ultimate L almost puts set theory in the same camp as number theory. There's no method except for girdle sentences for showing independence. And so maybe in that setting, uh, uh, we can do real transfinite mathematics. We can penetrate more deeply into the uncountable sets because we're not proving independence results, we're proving theorems. So that would be the hope. Uh, so there's a question, again, this is a question about cardinal characteristics. The question about cardinal characteristics for me is in the, okay, first, the first question, how does ultimate L deal with Reinhardt cardinals? So um, that's a evolving story, but if the ultimate L conjecture is true, then, uh, and you have an extendable cardinal, which is a modest large cardinal in V, uh, then there are no Reinhardt cardinals. And that's a proof in ZF. So the ultimate L conjecture, which is, Z, which is a ZFC conjecture, will uh, show that most of the large cardinals that we've identified, which contradict the axiom of choice, are inconsistent with the exception of the Reinhardt cardinal itself. Because there's just, but if you, you can't have two Reinhardt cardinals where you count Reinhardt cardinals in the appropriate way. So if the ultimate now, so I don't wanna get into how you count Reinhardt cardinals, but uh, a Reinhardt cardinal is, there's a Reinhardt cardinal, there's an elementary embedding from V to V. Okay, and then what do you mean if you have two? So I'm being a little evasive. There's a much more elegant, a uh, large cardinal notion that's much stronger called a Berkeley cardinal. And a delta is a Berkeley cardinal if for any transitive set to which delta belongs, any transitive set M, uh, there's an elementary embedding from M to M with critical point less than delta. Um, and uh, the ultimate L conjecture, the ZFC ultimate L conjecture will show that uh, Berkeley cardinals are inconsistent. I mean, there's another theorem I, I didn't talk about because I was trying to not talk about too many technical things. Uh, going on in the background is something called the Hod dichotomy theorem. So I defined Hod. And in some sense, if you're interested in the axiom of choice, the question is whether V is equal to Hod. That would be the simplest accounting for the axiom of choice. So something remarkable happens. If delta has, is an is a extendable cardinal, then either hot is very close to V, in fact, it has the delta cover and approximation properties, or hot is very far from V. There's no middle ground. And so the question is, is that really a dichotomy theorem? Maybe hot has to be close to V if you have an extendable cardinal. And the ultimate L conjecture would imply that. It would imply that Hod must be close to V. And so if, if you know that Hod is close to V from large cardinals, that makes it more likely that Hod is V. Um, so the Hod dichotomy theorem is a generalization of a famous dichotomy theorem of Jensen. So Jensen showed that V is either very close to L or very far from L. And then measurable cardinals imply that the, the close option is not true. L is far from V. Hod is not canonical. So the fact that you could even have a dichotomy theorem was a bit of a surprise. And you need large cardinals for it. Without large cardinals, the Hod dichotomy theorem isn't true. So large cardinals are trying to give us information. So if you have an extendable cardinal, Hod must be very close to V or very far from V. You can't prove this with less than an extendable really. And the conjecture is that Hod must be close to V. And uh, so that's the Hod conjecture, provably. So that's the Hod conjecture. And the ultimate L conjecture implies the Hod conjecture. 
If the Hodge conjecture is true, that would give a lot of evidence for the ultimate owl conjecture. And it's possible that the Hodge conjecture have a simple proof, not known. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Hi, Hugh. Uh, first of all, thanks for the talk. It's really, it's oh. really uh, uh, enlightening. Um, can you say a little bit more about the um, the status quo about the more chaotic future that you've outlined? Um, oh. I know there there's this proposed hierarchy of choiceless large cardinals um, that you and Peter have worked on. Uh -huh. Can you can you say a little bit about what the present status yeah. of that line of research is? So. Um... It, you can, so this is this hierarchy of Berkeley cardinals. And it looks like there's a hierarchy and there are questions one can ask, but, and you get some progress and then you just run into a wall. So it looks like there's no structure. I mean, for example, as an indication of how hard things are without choice, um, usually if you have two natural large cardinal notions, say A cardinal and B cardinal, you could ask, well, suppose I have an A cardinal and a B cardinal. I look at the least A cardinal and the least B cardinal. Well, maybe the least A cardinal is less than the least B cardinal or the other way around. And you can, des you can decide which is stronger. Well, if you take an extendable cardinal, I define that, and you take a, a Reinhardt cardinal, which I only informally defined. Now, usually a uh, Reinhardt cardinal says there's an elementary embedding from V to V. And you would think that the critical point of the embedding is the Reinhardt cardinal, but that's not how you want to count them because you can do J of J. But any embedding from V into V has a first fixed point. There's a, a first lambda bigger than the critical point that's sent to itself. So, okay. Suppose I have a, a extendable cardinal and a Reinhardt cardinal. Delta is extendable and lambda is the fixed point. So I could ask whether for the least one, delta is less than lambda or lambda is less than delta. So take two theories. The least extendable cardinal is less than the least Reinhardt cardinal, theory one. The least Reinhardt cardinal is less than the least extendable cardinal. That's theory two. Which is stronger? Doesn't seem to be any way to settle it. Now, if the ultimate L conjecture is true, then both are inconsistent. So uh, there's a, you can align them in that case. So, but that just shows you how subtle these choiceless axioms are. Basic questions, which are usually easy to answer, just become impenetrable. So, it, that's, uh, is that an indication that there isn't a structure here? I don't know. Um, so in the Berkeley hierarchy, there's not much that's been done since that paper of, uh, uh, with Peter and Joanne. And those questions, they just look impossible. Um, uh, it's the, the trouble with, if you're in a setting without choice, is it's very hard to do anything. Um, I mean, you can do some things. I mean, large cardinals seem to be trying to mimic the axiom of choice. There are a number of theorems which show that large cardinals have choice-like consequences. I'll give you one. Suppose you have a, a, a gamma uh, singular of cofinality omega and a limit of extendable cardinals then gamma plus is regular. This is a ZF theorem. And not only is gamma plus regular, the club filter on gamma plus is gamma plus complete. So these are the kinds of theorems which are trivial from the axiom of choice, but can fail without the axiom of choice. And large cardinals are trying to mimic the axiom of choice. And if the, um, if uh, the Hodge conjecture is true, then the existence of an extendable cardinal almost implies the axiom of choice. So if the Hodge conjecture is true in ZF, if delta is extendable, 
All successor cardinals bigger than delta are regular. You get a lot of choice-like consequences. So it all feels like large cardinals are trying to help us understand the universe of sets. And what they're doing is trying to prove the axiom of choice. It seems, uh, so we'll see. So that's a long-winded answer to your question, but there doesn't seem to be yet uh, a rich structure in the choiceless hierarchy, just there's some partial results. It, it looks like it's like a, you make progress and then you just run into a wall. And it doesn't seem like uh, we have the techniques to uh, resolve that wall. Okay, okay. That's... So th there are several more questions, but I think time is, is... So you, you want to answer one more questions? Um, sure. Okay. So I, I read, read it for you. Uh, the question is, is it right to expect uh, the GCH would be automatically solved once it came to the future that the RTMTL program was fulfilled positively? Can you hear me? Uh, let's see, um, where's the question? No, the question is not in the Q and A. Oh, okay. I mean, the, so the question is, is reasonable to, uh, to expect a solution of the GCH? Yeah. Well, again, large cardinals seem to be trying to tell us that GCH is true. Because you have uh, Solovey's theorem that uh, if you take a singular cardinal above a singular strong limit above a supercompact, the GCH must hold there. So again, as large cardinals are trying to give us information, no large cardinal can imply the GCH, we know that, but they seem to be implying as that a good approximation as, as one could hope. Um, I mean, I think the GCH question is a great question because the forcing axioms give you information about CH, but they don't seem anywhere close to resolving the GCH, either positively or negatively. And it can't be that we'll never know whether GCH is true, say for all large enough cardinals, you know, and it can't be. And the trouble is that if the GCH is failing, then you have to, the question is about, well, what is the power set function? What's two to the alpha omega? What's two to the alpha omega one? You have endless questions if you assume that the GCH, is, if you're not assuming GCH. And there are transfinite number of questions. And it's hard to see how we would ever answer them all. You know, maybe we can never know. But then that's going down the, the road of, we have the universe of sets. It, these questions all have determinate truth values, but we will never know the answers. And that to me is a somewhat of a discouraging view. So maybe we shouldn't be doing set theory then, right? I mean, it's, we can never know the answers to the questions we want. The, the, these are the basic questions in the universe of sets. So, I mean, I just, uh, uh, we, we, we have to, under, uh, it's our tasks as set theorists to come up with answers, not just say there is no answer. And the, the multiverse view is like saying, the multiverse view is more extreme, of course. It's saying the, there's the same, they're not determinant questions, but again, one has to ask, what does the multiverse view give you? If you're gonna have the multiverse view, how do you know the PD frame is consistent? Because there are gonna be universes where it's inconsistent if you allow non-standard models. So the extreme multiverse view can't account for consistency statements. And I, I challenge the skeptic. Saying the PD frame is consistent is a falsifiable claim. 
what's the argument for the truth of the consistency of the PD frame? No one has come up with an argument that's not eventually the argument it's consistent because it's true, PD is true. So the challenge of the skeptic and to the multiverse person is, well, in your mall, is, P, is the PD frame consistent? If so, why? If you're rejecting the universe of sets, I don't see how you can take a position on the consistency of the PD frame. And so, what, I mean, if you can't take, and, and, and it's not just a PD frame, it's, you know, every large cardinal comes with a new consistency statement. Uh, I mean, I think it's a remarkable fact in set theory that at least some will make the declaration the PD frame is consistent. I mean, there's something interesting there. We know we can't prove it, and yet we're willing to say it's true. Take the Riemann hypothesis. That has the same, if you reformulate it, has the same syntactic form as the consistency of the PD frame. There are a lot of number theorists who believe the Riemann hypothesis is true, but I've never heard anyone just declare it's true. And I'll give you a consistent, I'll give you a sociological proof. When the clay problems were proposed in 2000, uh, you know, the seven problems, one's been solved. The Riemann hypothesis is on that list. According to the original rules, and I haven't checked to see if the rules have been modified. If you came up with a counterexample to the Riemann hypothesis, you don't get the million dollars. You have to prove the Riemann hypothesis. Well, that's some indication that their scientific advisory board wouldn't even make the commitment with someone else's money that the Riemann hypothesis, you know, the, either way is interesting. You know, so what is it about, we know we can't prove PD is consistent, yet we're willing to say it's true. Does that mean if we show that you can't prove the Riemann hypothesis, we're gonna say it's true? I don't think so. What if Reinhardt Cardinal, what if Kahn or Reinhardt Cardinal implies the Riemann hypothesis, which may actually be a true theorem if Reinhardt Cardinals are inconsistent? Suppose, you know, we discover someone's proved that theorem. Kahn, Reinhardt Cardinal implies the Riemann hypothesis. Are we going to say the Riemann hypothesis is true? I don't think so. If you prove Kahn ZFC implies the Riemann hypothesis, I think everyone would say the Riemann hypothesis is true. So what is it about Kahn PD? Why is it we know we can't prove it, yet we say it's true? There's something going on there that's different in set theory. And the multiverse view just washes that out, or the extreme multiverse view. The, the extreme multiverse view can't take a position on any Kahn statement. I mean, you know, it depends what multiverse. Are you going to take the integers as standard and it's just all the standard models? But then how do you know PD is consistent? You just know it, you don't know. I don't see in a multiverse conception of the universe of sets, I don't understand a coherent basis for the claim the PD frame is consistent. PD is consistent. It's only when you have V and the truth of PD and V that you, you can conclude that PD is consistent. And I challenge anyone to come up with another proof. I mean, 40 years ago, when PD looked like it was so strong, it wasn't clear it was consistent. The structure theory gave powerful evidence for it, but what about the stronger forms of determinacy? ADR, those were less clear, but now we see how they all fit together and, and we can now make the declaration that ADR is consistent. But again, this is lost in the multiverse view.
So that's to me is the fundamental issue with a multiverse view. It's, uh, I don't see how you can make any kind of declaration. 